Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. You like these videos, man? Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, watch the video to the end. Supports our uh, channel in a big way with the algorithms, man. Sends the, co sends the videos to other people uh, whenever they hit up YouTube, and it keeps this gravy train rolling. Today we're looking at Grendel number one, written by Matt Wagner, drawn by the Panda Bros with Jay Geldof on inks. This is after the initial three issue Grendel series that Matt Wagner put together himself that was like very rough, very crude. I think he was very young when he put that together. Then he does the Mage comics and in the back of uh, certain issues of Mage, there's the Devil by the Deed uh, kind of picto fiction, illustrated prose, kind of retelling of the Hunter Rose, mm -hmm. a Grendel character written in the voice of Christine Sparr, the, the, the book author of that uh, you know, set of stories, that book. And in this issue, issue one of the regular series, we're going to be following this Christine Spar. Go back character. to the cover just for a second. I have to point out the screen oh, yes. on this background character. It's this round screen that we've kind of used and, sh and shown maybe in our own work a little bit. Absolutely. But it's one of my favorite screen tones. And I think what they do with it's really cool. Like your center point's like right here. And if you look like the close up of her face is all those screens manipulated. I'm I assume light it out and stuff. I don't think you could cut out some of this stuff, but who knows? But it's a cool effect for like that background to be uh, to create some depth between our Grendel figure in the foreground and the figure in the back by not having solid black lines, but rather using this screen tone. Jimmy, how pretty cool effect? How eighties does this look with that like? It's it's that airbrush with the yeah. hooked up to the markers, just shooting out the fucking jizz from the from the 100%. Uh, from the Copics, man, and it can't get more eighties. I think when I had uh, Mario Paint for Super Nintendo, that was like one of the functions you could choose for airbrush, like Mac Paint airbrush with, yes. the, with the pixels that are far apart. That feels exactly like how that would work, like eight bit kind of uh, airbrush effect. Yeah, but it it does feel totally eighties. It reminds me of Whisper, which yeah. was the Ninja eighties color comic. And uh, yeah, of the same sort of time period, and yeah, the Kamiko logo is kind of kind of classic too. Totally, but look at that like chunky white media mm -hmm. put up there for a uh, Spar's hair. Uh, Kamiko bolstered their color palette as being much much grander than the rest of the competition. Like for whatever reason, and I think this happens with a lot of. Uh, a lot of commodities is the innovation for the the bones of the thing kind of stops kind of like think of the television and then you put it in you know a big wooden box and then that becomes the attractive thing but it's still the same thing the drive the the steering wheel is always on the same side that kind of deal uh for some reason in the 80s when the prestige of comics starts to increase that's when you hear talks of baxter paper color palettes like the consumer becomes far more aware of the nuts and bolts that go into comics or something and Kamiko was like we have 120 colors that we can use and you can look at the color chart yes. the reason i have those colors is because they opted to to add black to the mixture so so many Kamiko comics would have diarrhea palettes this comic does not uh, but it does have more colors than you're used to in your standard, you know, 1986 comic book. And by the way, 1986 scene. Yes, for sure. <laughs> that magic year of comics. Now, you know, this is chapter one of, I believe, 12. Uh, Dark Horse reprinted this uh, series. And I have sporadic issues of, of these first 12. But I have all 12 of the Dark Horse with new computer coloring. Uh, I do kind of prefer this because it kind of keeps that 80s motif. And these Panda Bros, uh, can we agree that their sort of design sensibility is like those... What's the, what's the name of that guy? Like those like... Mitch what? O'Connell? Not Mitch O'Connell, who we will see in the back here. Because Mitch O'Connell wasn't Mitch O'Connell yet. You know, he's still he's still Ginger Fox. I know who you're talking about, and yeah. I can't. And the name escapes me. And I have his book on my shelves. Yeah, it's like it's like famous pure painter. White. You would see them in like uh, hair salons and stuff. Waiting rooms. Yes. And it would be these chicks. Yes, totally, a hundred percent. I'm so mad I didn't read the book, <laughs> and I'm so mad the name is is uh, escaping me. We'll probably think of it in like ten minutes. I, I won't because I never knew the guy's name, but I I know the look. 
Yeah, um, it totally is of that 80s, uh, you, you know, style ultimately is what you're saying here. And I think it does add to the book, or at least to the sort of the period quality of the book. Yeah, yeah. The Panda Bros, like, such a love-hate relationship with them growing up when I was grabbing these comics because it is so odd and it's so stylistic and, and different. But uh, upon checking this out, kind of dig it. You got all these ladies in these 80s power suits. The ultimate, like, icon of, like, the 1980s, you know, power suit workforce lady, to me, is the is the stepmom in the first Hellraiser movie. She's got this hair. She's got the shoulder padded pantsuits and shit like that. And that's what these girls are. They're, you ain't gonna find any long hair in Grendel universe. And then when he does these, well, when the bros do these touches right here with like zigzag hair, you know, it's approaching Peter Chung kind of aesthetic yep. in a way. I see some of that. Also, that kind of zigzag hair is neat because it's it's cartoon language. Yeah. You know, like there's no actual version of that in real life, but it works in a comic very well. <laughs> there's uh, she she I think she has a uh, Christine Spar has a column called called Crime Watch. And there's some joke in here about like, why is everything watched these days? Obvious Watchmen uh, reference. It's um, surprising to me as a first issue how this issue reads and how kind of quiet it is. If you're here for, I don't know, superhero action, violence, something with Grendel, like it's, it's very tame. It is. It, 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 the slow build. It builds questions, you know, like, uh, you got this kid, he disappeared. Is he alive? Is he not? This Kabuki theater guy is obviously a bad, bad actor. There are missing kids in every city that this Kabuki theater is performing at. So that is the methodology of Matt Wagner for this first issue. He's trying to tease you out with the the kind of mystery behind the scenes that's that's go that's unfolding rather than just showing you Grendel, you know, watching crimes take place from from the rooftops. Yeah, I think it's an interesting uh villain too in the context of a superhero comic. Like I feel like Kabuki is something that you as a superhero fan, it's come up a million times in my life for, I don't know if that's why or if Kabuki's more popular everywhere than just comics, but it seems like that's a really interesting character to bring in because, one, he's an actor, so you have sort of the, this uh, secret identity built in, in a way. Yeah. Like, this is how we see him. He looks great on a comic book page, but what's he look like 10 o'clock in the morning? Yes. You know, it's a totally different guy, so you kind of have that built in, that, that superhero mythology, but a little bit different, a little different lens. <laughs> Pretty quickly. First off, he's the most interesting guy we see up to this point. So you know there's going to be something to him. But when he starts licking uh, Miss Spar's hand, <laughs> like, you know that uh, that there's more to this guy than meets the eye. And there's a lot that meets the eye. Yeah, and by the way, center of the page. Pretty big panel. <laughs> Extreme close-up. And he's sticking that tongue in between, so that's there's, sim there's symbolism going we on have there. saliva. A lot of saliva in that... Uh... Yeah, man. Right in that crease. The little boy, like, it looks like a poster child of, like, 80, 80s to 90s ad art, mm -hmm. you know? Like, I, like those rad dudes cards and shit like that, man. But then there are times when you see him with this, like, rigid ch cheekbones, and it looks like, say, maybe Louis Spicoli, 20-year-old surfer kind of character. Good page of storytelling here. Plucks, plucks a piece of hair out. But he doesn't, the boy doesn't quite know it. And then you establish that just in case if you didn't read that pluck, beyond the shadow of a doubt, this dude took a couple locks. Not a bad page of storytelling there. No. They say a rising tide raises all ships, Jimmy. And cartoonist Kayfabe, the YouTube channel, is brought to you by the comic books that we make. Uh, we each have a bunch of stuff that's in print. So let's give it a quick run through and... Kayfabers, if you dig the channel, you dig our comics, Kayfabe affect these comics, let these publishers know that cartoonist Kayfabe is a force to be reckoned with, man. Uh, to begin with, my earliest graphic novel, WYSIWYG, Portrait of a Serial Hacker, follows the history of high technology from the phone system to WikiLeaks through the vessel of a single computer hacker, 288 pages. Back to print is the box sets and uh, new printings of each volume of Hip Hop Family Tree, which is my linear uh, sort of retelling of the history of hip hop and rap music. Four volumes in that set. I drew this stuff from 2013 to 
to about 2015. After that comes X-Men Grand Design, where I take the history of X-Men, probably 8,000 pages of material, uh, mostly by Chris Claremont, miniseries, combine it all into one big uh, story, 240 pages of primetime X-Men comics. Get these volumes while they're still in print. There's an omnibus as well. The stuff that I've been putting my energy to lately is Red Room Comics, Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit, The Anti-Social Network. This trade paperback is on stands today, collects the 2021 issues of Red Room, and lots of extra material in the back. Coming up in March is Red Room Trigger Warnings, issue number one, going to be coming out on a monthly basis, every issue completely self-contained. This is the cover that's going to be on the racks in the stores. These are the variants to go along with these comics, including the Jim Rug, by way of Robert Crumb, Zap Comics Zero cover. I'm going to go in reverse order, Ed, and start with Hulk Grand Design. This is my next book that's going to be available in comic shops everywhere starting in March, but you can pre-order it now. This is a retelling of the Hulk history, celebrating 60 years of the Incredible Hulk coming in March, and uh, 10,000 pages distilled down into two oversized issues, and these are some of the variant covers that will be available for Hulk Grand Design, Ed Piscor, Peach Momoko, Marcus Martin, and now Jeff Darrow. Yes. So you can order any of these at your local comic shop. These are not retailer incentives, so just let the comic shop know which cover you want. Get all the covers if you want to. They won't cost anything extra. And uh, pick this up in March, but order it now. Next time you're at your comic shop, or call your comic shop. Let them know about Incredible Hulk Grand Design. You can also still get Street Angel, Deadly Girl Live from Image Comics, a homeless ninja on a skateboard. This collects eight complete stories of the Deadliest Girl Alive and is available wherever books are sold. And The Plain Janes, my 500-page uh, homage to shoujo manga about a group of high school kind of outcasts who start doing public art around their community and get all kinds of trouble as a result of that. Uh, one of the first young adult graphic novels. This thing actually began in 2005 and was just completed in 2019. So you can still pick that up again wherever books are sold. Now that we're done paying the bills, back to the video. This is always fun. Uh, why is Matt Wagner not drawing this Grendel comic? He's still he's still deep in 15 issues of Mage, which I didn't realize it went to 15 issues. I thought it was like a solid year's worth. And then collecting a uh, collection of the, the Hunter Rose story. If you see that stuff, the roughness and the crudity of just the 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 sort of line work. And to be honest, like the story is is pretty basic. Also, you would have. You you wouldn't necessarily bet on that pony if if that's the only comic you read, man. You you wouldn't you wouldn't have it in your mind that this Matt Wagner guy is like going places. It was fun, it was cool, but it was like that kind of like Reggie Byers level of like shuriken, but maybe even be below that kind of thing. Yeah, I thought we were gonna have to fight that for a minute. <laughs> big, big fan of shuriken over here. I, I it's interesting some of the details of the Grendel graphic novel here. And by the way, I, I think I think I have a second printing. Oh, cool. Um, Maybe I have a half, second printing. Eight and a half by eleven is is the size they're collecting them, which is what we saw with the Nexus trade mm. paperback right. from that initial run. I, I feel like that's a Love and Rockets thing. That's yeah. a a little bit of a raw thing. It's sort of like, how do we present graphic novels or collections or comics for older readers? And that size seemed to be one of the choices everybody made. But an Alan Moore intro, and then like some really great artists doing, I guess, pinups. Steve Rude, John Tottleman, Steve Bissett, and then the Panda Brothers. That's, an, that's a great snapshot of like 1986 and some, some interesting cartoonists and artists. I do guess this is an era where if you, if you change one mm -hmm. letter, uh, it costs you more. So I was thinking like maybe in the reprint, they yes. fix that, but not. <laughs> it's expensive to correct type. That would cost money. Back to the comic. Uh, we put put the boy to bed. And he's got a lot of moose in that hair, and he ain't washing that out at bedtime, man. Look at the... That's look, amazing look hair. Look at those locks. <laughs> they, everybody has amazing hair, and it's all short. And then you see our kabuki guy. He's doing some sort of tantric gimmick. Again with the saliva. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and a great sequence here. You know, very clear storytelling wise, what we have going on here makes me wonder because, uh, like, I don't know where these Pander Bros come from before this. You know, this is this is what I know them from. Is Matt Wagner an artist supplying them with with layouts 
uh, for this stuff because the storytelling is all there. Um, yeah, and a sequence that's not that easy. Like he's going to mind control this kid by eating his hair or whatever and very easy to follow. Like you don't have to read it to see exactly what is happening. Yeah. That's a that's a tall order. On one hand, when you see this baggy gimmick, it makes me think of the Kevin Nolan uh, Madman uh, card that he drew. But that's Mage. Right. The lightning bolt. Very important iconography in the history of comic books. No doubt about it. I always think of that lightning bolt, you know, as like the super cool t-shirt. But when you see it here as like a onesie, it's just pointing right at your crotch. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, very often the, the Mad Men uh, mage fans are portly 40-year-olds. <laughs> so it's pointing to that belly. <laughs> I do like this whole sequence of him even walking from even the previous page, like some yeah. of the walking down the hallways, going down the stairwell. Like, these are good panels where, you know, they're, they're calm panels, but, like, that's a pretty cool-looking panel. Yeah, not bad at all, man. And I guess this is our 2G row when he's got his gimmicks off, man. Now, uh, like, dialogue placement, the importance of where you put balloons, this is actually a, was a confusing piece of storytelling to me. Because uh, we got, you know, Ants and Babe, she's calling out. And uh, it's her saying, I'm home. But when I first read it, because you have these strong parallels that yes. almost touch the bottom, I almost read that as a different panel in a way. Like, I know it's one image, but I thought that this dialogue piece was coming from the other side of the door. If she, if you would have just had this lettering right there, it would have been, there would have been no question. Uh, but the boy is not there. This That lettering placement bothers me a little bit less than this tangent, which looks like something out of an Eros comic. Yes, for sure, man. <laughs> Absolutely. Maybe just a uh, you know, different color could have helped with that. Or you know what else? Uh, Black, Black Kiss. Mm -hmm. Black yes, Kiss yes. would have this. <laughs> <laughs> I like that triangle shape panel, too. That's a cool page opener. This right here? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I see that little stuff, and I do so many just, you know, rectangular panels. Um, that's a great panel. You know, like, nothing's compromised there. It's perfectly clear. It's just kind of a cool, like, switch to a new scene. There's your exterior shot, and let's dive in. And it's it's that classic cliche moment. We've seen it a thousand times in pop culture where for some... And we've seen it enough times to know that if we have a loved one missing, the cops ain't going to do anything for 72 hours. So they get that in there real quick. Uh, it creates a situation where Christine needs to take things into into her her own hands, man. I like the backstory too that she's connected to this guy from preparation on the book. Yes, uh, kind of neat to flesh out this cast the way you know the, the little bit of fleshing out that we get in this issue. It, it, it seems very organic. I find this stuff so so inspiring too because it, because it's all pure drawing, Jimmy. Like this this uh, precinct. You know, it's not a light box photograph that they pulled off Google image search or something like that. Like, this is a drawn thing. And we just don't have that much of that in comics anymore. You know, and it works. It's, 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 all, it's all beautiful shorthand. Gets the point across. And it's about the story. It's not about, you know, drawing Etzel Brick or whatever. Reggie Byers draws this Robotech comic. I see his name right here. Yeah, that's where he started. And then, you know, goes off and starts uh, self-publishing with Victory. Christine's uh, doing her spiral, you know. She's a writer, so it's very romantic for them to be drunks and things. Yeah, I wonder about the um, getting drunk whenever your kid's missing. Like, what if you get the hot phone call tip and now you've got to take a cab instead of your flying car? Right. <laughs> yeah, man, these flying cars. Like, very unclear, like, what, what the, uh, you know, how far in the future this is or whatever. And Grendel as a character, as like a presence, like I've read some Grendel comics in my day. I still don't know what it is, really. You know, it's this mysterious kind of thing where you got future ones, you got even further future ones. Yeah, Grendel Warchild. Warchild, that was Pac that. Yeah, Pac that was a big one for me because like there weren't Grendel comics for a while. There was litigation yeah. and stuff. And so like when I'm reading comics, it's in that time between Grendels and then like Grendel Warchild comes out and it was so badass looking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, with those busy covers. covers. <laughs> but there was sort of this, like, known legacy. Like, you know, the idea of getting new Grendel comics was such a big deal at that moment. Yeah, yeah, and I get into comics in a heavy way, like the, the direct market a little after that. And then there was enough Grendel that I just did not know where to begin. That is a weird piece of Grendel, and I wonder how, how they'll manage that with, like, a TV show and, like, trying to make, I assume, books 
user friendly and easy to find and, and right order. This is neat as she's like turning into Hunter Rose. Is and, that what it is? I mean, that's what it looks like to me, right? Yeah. Yes. But it feels like that's what's going on is like she's transforming. <laughs> And it's a great sequence, man, where she just needs one more piece to the puzzle. And I think earlier it was like established that she does like kendo stick classes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's important. You got to mention that piece. Looks supremely badass when she brings her flying Corvette to the library. Yeah, it's super cool looking. And you got these like little moments, man, pretty good compositions where she breaks in. And once again, a drawn public library that you know, it comes from imagination. You know, you look at a little reference, you distill it down through the Panda Bros voice. I, lo I love it, you know? Like, there's far too much. And, and I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody, man, of just using too much reference for, for stuff. You know, I like that Ivan Brunetti idea of, like, take your time, draw the complete thing, and however long it takes, now draw it in five minutes, now draw it in two minutes. Like, that's the thing. Yeah, I like that, that's, too. That's the thing to use, man. We've been pointing out good sequences throughout this issue. I feel like this is a really fun sequence. Totally. You're finally starting to get the, like, get in the costume, after hours. You know, it's it's the fun of the superhero. It's that movement, and uh, this is the setup for it, so it works pretty well. There's the iconic mask. And the second she kicks it on, we got that Argent character who's who's from uh, the first uh, three issue miniseries, and he's got some gnarly hair. He's got some outlaw comics, James O'Barr mullet mulletry going on. And like as soon as she like tightens it, he's like, "What? Yeah, what the fuck?" He sniffs it. <laughs> there she is, man, with her double knife gimmick because of her kendo stick classes. They call it a fork, and I feel like they could do better on the naming of that weapon. Forks are weird. That's fair. I'm with you. But there it is, man. That's all the Grendel you get in issue one. And the writing has to be such that you're like, I gotta see issue number two. After reading this, I'm kind of curious. I would, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna go reread issue number two. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's, it, it is... It, it's kind of all set up, which is yeah. a weird number one issue. It is. But, I mean, storytelling used to be different. You know, like, I, I think of that Dan Clow's modern cartoonist pamphlet where it's like, it's got to be a roller coaster of entertainment and it's the other thing that it can be. And this feels different than that. You know, like, this feels uh, from a different era in terms of, like, we're going to slow, we're going to build this. He calls, uh, Matt Wagner, he calls these things books, you know, mm -hmm. like, and it's part one of 12. Uh, they seem to be on board at, you know, Kamiko. Com I mean, you could get a subscription and this might be one of the very few independent comic subscriptions that pans out, you know, those issues come out, you know, very rarely does that ever happen. Yeah. I, I'll say this too. This Grendel series is a really interesting one yeah. beyond this first story and the Panda brothers. Like I think Tim Sell does a stint in it. That's some cool looking art. Uh, Bernie Moreau does some and Matt Wagner does these like two issue graphic novels of like, I don't know, 25 panel page grids or something that are pretty fascinating. There, and, so it's, and he, it's quite a run. And he calls them graphic novels. Like this issue begins a new novel. This, this issue concludes a new novel. So he had these ideas of them being these sprawling things that you just, you're not getting it all in the 22 pages or yeah. in this case, 25 pages. Hoche Anderson draws like some of the last ones. Oh, I didn't realize that. Joe Matt does the color on a lot of these. So a lot of people, Matt Wagner has given a lot of people kind of their first shots and Grendel was a big deal in the 80s, man. So these these guys were, were having some prime time yeah, exposure. This, this would have been a time, too, like Kamiko would have been running like Elementals. It's yeah. a long-running series that people liked. So you combine that. I don't know how many issues this runs, but into the 20s. You know, like it's a this, substantial. I, thought, I think it might even be more than that, man. It's a substantial series. So, like, you know, you can see Kamiko is positioned well with, you know, a couple of these outstanding series, long-time running series. Johnny Quest ran uh, into the double digits, too. And some interesting issues there, like, look at that Dave Stevens cover. Oh, you know? totally. I mean, that's, anytime you get to look at Dave Stevens, I feel like that's a win. It would have fucking spinoffs, dude. Jezebel Jade, uh, drawn by the Cuberts. You know yes. what I'm saying, man? Like, There was um, Johnny Quest Classics, three issues that were all Doug Wildey based on episodes, but it's Doug Wildey art yeah. throughout. Like, yeah, there's a... There's... Kamiko did some interesting stuff. Here's our Mitch O'Connell cameo appearance, man. 
I like his work a lot, and it's and it's not quite Mitch O'Connell at this stage. Yeah. Like I have this graphic novel, and it's cool, but I think it's the only real comics he he ever does. You see germs in there, mm-hmm. definitely. You know, you see germs, but looking at it as one piece, you wouldn't necessarily say Mitch O'Connell, but you could see him in there. It's pretty cool, man. Anyhow, man, there's our blast from the past, and I believe this might be our one piece of Matt Wagner artwork. Uh, I think that's him. Yeah, it looks like it. Um, on this issue. It looks like it, and then like the screen tone in the back really makes me think of Matt Wagner. Yes. You know, you'd always hear about his design his design acumen in these comics, and I think that was a big part of it, the blacks and whites and uh, I using mean, some of the production I mean, this, stuff. This is him, like yeah. all this kind of stuff. You know, this is that template of like the Devil by the Deed, uh, Picto Fiction, Illustrated Pro stuff that, that he was doing in those back pages of Mage. Anyhow, man, fun comics to look at. Uh, maybe we t- we take a look at future issues of this this initial storyline. And what I've been doing uh, in my archives, Jimmy, is going through and pulling out all the issues of Gr- Grendel that I have and seeing what I have and what I don't, man, because I would just see them, scoop them up whenever I find them. I got a bunch scattered around, and I don't think I need much to uh, to complete that run of this series, man. Need to get a hold of that graphic novel i think probably dark horse put something out with that that first uh three issues because uh it would be worth taking a look at on the channel the crudity of it or whatever you want to call it like is uh very inspiring to me one of the other cool series dark horse did was you know how everybody's doing like the black white and reds now oh yeah they did a grendel like early on and um some fantastic artists in in that so uh yeah there's a lot of grendel that would be fun to look at for sure man shouts to jim mafood i think he does a piece or two in there man good to go for now K Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. What's out there, Jimmy? Hulk Grand Design, everybody. Tell your local comic shops that you want copies. Tell them what copies you want. A lot of cool covers to choose from. But uh, let those comic shop know. Like, try to run the K Fab effect on Hulk Grand Design. I will appreciate it. And you can join me on patreon.com slash jimrug to see how I made Hulk Grand Design. Lots of original art process, behind-the-scenes stuff there. I appreciate the kayfabe effect on that first round of Red Room Comics in 2021 and the trade paperback for the Anti-Social Network. But we need to keep that rocking on uh, Red Room Trigger Warnings, issue number one, and uh, the monthly series that will be coming out in four installments. Every issue completely self-contained. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit. Uh, you can read those comics on my Patreon today. Three bucks for the archive there. More than 200 pages worth of strips. Uh, you can get to our, all these links in our link trees in the description below this video. Help support the channel. Buy our books. Increase those Amazon rank numbers. What else do we have, Jimmy? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Keeping those margin orders, man, we're going to be on our way. Read more comics.